What's up, guys? I'm uh, Mark McKenzie, a defender for the United States, and I am now, and I have the privilege of being in the presence of, or at least via Zoom, with my guy Mo Adu. What's happening, baby? I'm good, bro. Are you talking about being in my presence? This is an honor. I mean, this is an absolute honor to be here chatting with you. I'm just, I've been a fly on the wall and had a chance to, you know, kind of watch your trajectory and see where you're at now. And I'm just, I'm a proud kind of big brother type. This is a big brother moment for me that I'm proud to see what you've been doing and excited to chat with you, bro. No, I appreciate it. And, and before I start, you know, Mo is the guy that, that I was looking up to because I was that young kid in the stands, you know, coming to the union games. I had uh, the opportunity to hop in the gym a few times with some of the first team players when I was about 15, you know what I'm saying? So I was a scrawny kid and, you know, you got Mo pushing, what, 80 90 trying to trying to get me to do some bench presses <laughs> with these little things man i'm 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 barely pushing 45 i'm like <laughs> <laughs> you come a long way don't don't lie to the people man don't lie to the people you came in there hungry and and earned your keep um but no i mean that's a good that's a good starting off point because i look back at that young group of players that that had a chance to come and train with the first team and the reason that you caught my eye that you stood out was for a few different reasons obviously I saw you on the field and I was like, this kid's got something. But more importantly, you had the desire. You were hungry. You you wanted more. You know, it wasn't just me pulling you and saying, hey, come come do these little extra things. You wanted to do that stuff. So, you know, after day one of me saying like, Mark, maybe you should do this in the gym. It was you coming and saying like, hey, what are we doing today after training? So don't don't try to give me too much credit because it all starts with you having that desire to want more, to to know that you have more that you're capable of and then to pursue that. I think sometimes that's, that can be a daunting task and maybe intimidating for young players, but you definitely have that, that personality, that desire to keep challenging yourself. And that's why you're in the position you're in now. No, nah, so uh, I appreciate that. Um, I remember stepping my first time, you know, in the first team locker room and, and it's a bit intimidating at times to, to step in that environment. And you're like, man, you know, these are guys I was watching on the field. Now I'm in the locker room, you know, the bands of the jokes and you're like, oh, we're going to the gym, you know, before all this, you're building up to getting onto the pitch, right? And that's where you handle the business, you know? So you got those little jitters. Um, but but I remember you guys kind of taking me under your wing, uh, just off me the words, you know, just focus on doing little things, the simple things well, you know, connect your passes, take, you know, a good first touch here in this situation. And even in the, the stumbling and, and the mistakes, you know, I make and still like, yo, come on, clean yourself up. Let's go, you know, take, you know, in this situation, you got to do this here, you know, so, so, you know, focus on that next time. Um, you know, so it's little moments, you know, that helped me and, and, and learning, you know, about what it's like being a first team player and being a young kid trying to, you know, take those steps to be, you know, hopefully in one, your shoes one day. So, um, yeah, that's enough to say, you know, I get to, to, to play the game at the highest level and, and it's much to credit to, to guys like yourself. So, uh, yeah, kudos to you, but yeah, that's, uh, let, let's, let's jump into it. Uh, how did you, how did you get involved in football in the first place? You know, let's, let's take it way back. Oh man, you're gonna you're gonna date me now. You're gonna show my age a little bit. <laughs> I got into it because I mean, you know, my parents are both Nigerian, and and after the whole continent of Africa, this is the first sport. Football is the first sport, so it's a no brainer. I have three older sisters, a younger brother, but for as long as I can remember, there was always a ball in the house. And you know, I think back to some of my first memories of this sport. They involve. They involved my family. They involved my dad, first and foremost. Like, he was the one that really got me going, got me in, got me hooked onto this game. And, you know, I would I would either watch my sisters because they were all playing, you know, AYSO and all that coming up. And then I'd watch my dad. He would play in this Sunday league. And just seeing just seeing him play, although it's a Sunday league, it's a bunch of old men running around. Some, some think that they still got it. Some never had it, but think that they still got it. <laughs> but just seeing, you know, seeing the way – he enjoyed it so much. He was so passionate about it. Um, he would score goals and do little different celebrations uh-huh. afterwards. And just like the the passion, the, the enjoyment that he got out of it, I think naturally I just gravitated towards it. And I started playing, I think the first time I started playing organized, I was around like four years old playing AYSO. And, you know, it's fun. You, you're scoring, I don't know, five, six goals per game. And it's just, it's, it was, it was fun for me. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the camaraderie of it. I enjoyed the the communal uh, component to the game as well and how it kind of just brought people together. And again, like I talked about, it was a family sport for us. So if we weren't at my game, we were at my sister's games. And eventually when my brother started playing, same thing for him. And every weekend that wasn't, that we didn't have a game or a tournament, 
boom. My dad's like, all right, we have breakfast, cool. Then we go down to the park, um, which is just like down the street from my house. And he had us just doing individual training. Crazy enough, like, you know, in the moment, you don't think about, I'd rather be doing something else because this is all I knew. This is what I love doing. And now looking back on it, I'm like, <laughs> I wonder if I could have spent that time doing something else, like <laughs> hanging out with my friends or, you know, but at the time, I, like I said, I enjoyed it. That's all I wanted to do. I wanted to go, I, similar to the story that you just told about you being in, introduced to the first team. And initially it's someone kind of saying like, hey, you should do this. But after like day one or day two, it's you now leading them saying like, hey, what are we doing? It was the same thing for me. Like the first couple of days, I'm like, okay, cool. This is what we're doing. But then after you get that itch for it, it was like, hey, dad, are we going to the park? You know? And so mm-hmm. those are my earliest memories of uh, of the sport. And I look back on them with fond memories. And I'm, I'm grateful that that introduction happened. And I was fortunate enough that I, I grew up in a household where, as I said, I had Nigerian parents. So the game was ingrained in them. And they naturally just passed it along to me. Yeah, that's, I think that, that, that itch, you know, it develops over time, you know, because I think about like my dad, uh, you tell the story about your dad. And I remember my dad taking me outside, you know, um, uh, we used to live in a townhouse and in the backyard, there was like a, a big strip of grass um, and everybody kind of shared it. And there was a, a road that, that ran across it uh, that was just parallel to it. And we would just go out there and we just kick the ball around, kick the ball around. Um and he would make me do drills. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. You know, I'm tired of doing this daggone, you know, this this cut and dribbling through the cones, weaving, okay, you know, passing through these cones here. You know, and then he would uh, – I hated it. I hated it at the time, but I'm thankful for it. But he would force me to use my left foot, you know. Uh-huh. And he would call He would call my cousins out. He would call my god brother out. He would, everybody would try and come out. And he would beat me up, man, and everybody pushed me over. He was like, not forcing <laughs> to use his left foot. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know. Um, but as time went on, you know, it was me like, yo, Pops, you know, he come, he's coming back from, from a long day at work because he, uh, he used to work at the hospital. So he got back, you know, in the evenings and I'm sitting around, I'm after class, you know, I've already, I've already done my homework, you know, I'm making sure I'm planning out my afternoon. So that way, by the time we get home, I could try and beat up on him a little bit, you know, show him a little move I saw on YouTube. Or, when he's uh, tired now. Yeah, exactly. You know, you got, you got a <laughs> strategy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I had to pay him back a little bit. I was like, listen, you you will put me through the ring of here. So now, you know, I'm gonna get you back. But uh, but yeah, you know, looking back on those memories, it's like the the just the the joyful aspect, you know, that that genuine raw love for the game, you know, and that's where it kind of builds up. Um and and I think that is the starting point for 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 any any young footballer, you know, coming up in the game. Um so uh, now tell tell us a little bit about your your youth academy grow or your youth your youth coming up because it's a little bit different you know for me having the youth system uh, with with the union and now a lot of MLS academies have have youth uh, youth systems so what was it like for you coming up? <laughs> yeah, it was different, definitely different. Um, first that I ever even knew about like academies is uh, because how did we, I don't even know how we got these tapes, but this is again, showing my age. We had like this VHS. You know what that is? VHS? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. VCR, all right, listen, you to put the tape listen, in there and all that. You're not, you're not that old. All right. That's not true. Here, all right. <laughs> but this is true story. So like uh, the first time I ever knew like what an academy was relative to, to this sport was because um, my dad had these. So my dad used to also coach. So anytime that I played literally at every level that I played in, my dad was either my coach um, by, by virtue, just because he was my dad, he was yeah. going to coach me or he was actually a part of the coaching staff. You know what I mean? And, but then he also coached his own team, a couple age groups older than me that I would train with sometimes as well. But so my, um, so as I said, I started off playing AYSO and I think when I turned about seven or eight, how it came on our radar, I'm not really sure. Again, my dad was more in tune with what was going on the soccer dynamics around our area and um, I got introduced to this this club team called Santos, uh, and it was U10. I was like seven or eight playing with them, and that was my first introduction to like club soccer. And then from there, kind of progressed. I moved from that team to a better team, this team called Arsenal, and then you know, blase blase, you keep moving up the rankings. And but the academy that that was there was no academy for us. That was like non-existent. I only knew what an academy was because he had these IX VHSs. And so like when I talk to you about this individual training we would do, he would get some of those drills and or he would have us watch the video and be like, all right, 
when I tell you this is what we're doing at the park, this is what I mean. This is what it should look like. Right. And I'm watching the, I don't know if you've ever seen these <laughs> IX kids train. Bro, these <laughs> IX kids are like, bear in mind, my exposure to the game has just been AYSO, my dad, my uh -huh. family. That's like the highest level that I'm seeing at that, at that age. And then I'm watching these kids and I'm like, wait, what? He, he just, he, <laughs> what's he doing right now? Feet were quick. And I was just like, okay, this is, this is different. Um, but he started introducing some of that, some of those kind of drills and trying to get us to focus more on, you know, the technical side and working on technique and all that kind of stuff. But so my club journey was, or my youth journey, it, it was club. And then uh, ODP was a thing back then. Mm -hmm. So you go to your, your ODP tryouts and, Went to my first ODP tryout. I was younger again, playing, I think it was like under 12, maybe at that point. And I was 11, 10, 11. So I was training with those guys, made the first cut. Then you go to like regional or make the state team and you yep. go to regional camp. Yep. Um, I was, I made the regional team and then I was like on the C group. So I didn't go to the national camp, but that was my first introduction and, and getting my feet wet and getting a chance to now see, to like broaden my horizons. Now I'm seeing kids from, other states and what that level looks like. And, you know, you start going to different club tournaments like Dallas Cup and Surf Cup mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff where you're playing against the best kids from around the country. You're playing against some international teams too. And so that was my first like kind of, wow, this is this is serious type thing. I remember we played against Man United under 14s. I think it was at Dallas Cup and they were they were nice. They beat us 4-0. Yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> they waxed us. And I remember they had this kid named Bubbles. I don't know if he ever made it or not, but yeah, they had this kid named Bubbles who was a striker who was just, I mean, the kid uh, was raw, raw. Like to the I remember his name still, Bubbles, right? <laughs> but that was that was my journey. You know, it was I didn't get a chance to to go to um, to Bradenton. Um, I know some of my club teammates ended up going to Bradenton and being a part of the residency program. And I remember I used to be so, so envious, like so jealous, like, like damn, why am I, why am I not getting these looks? You know, these guys are on my club team. I train with them every single week. We play together on the weekends. I'm just as good, if not better than them. And, and, but so why am I not getting these looks? And, you know, my dad was, this is where it pays off to kind of have a good support system around you because mm -hmm. My parents, I mean, albeit they're my, my biggest fans, but they're also my harshest critics and they're also my sounding board of, of of sense and reality and putting things in perspective. And, you know, my dad used to always just tell me, like, look, at the end of the day, if you have a goal in mind, it doesn't matter. Every, no one's pathway mimics another person's, right? There might be some similarities, but at the end of the day, if you're both trying to get to that point, his path might be a straight shot. Your path might be a little bit swiggly or some ups and downs, whatever the case is. But if you stick true to it, if you continue being dedicated to what you're trying to achieve, you'll get there. And I mean, as a young kid, it's hard to hear that because I'm like, right. what are you, Dad, get out of here. What are you talking about? <laughs> He's getting a chance. Why am I not getting a chance? Like, exactly. I should be there. Like, what are you talking about? But fair enough. He did a good job of and keeping my head in tune and just having me just keep working, working, working. And God willing, my path uh, paved the way for itself and it worked out. Yeah, man. It's uh, it's funny you bring up the challenges because I want to kind of touch on that a little bit, you know, uh, being it's Black History Month, you know, and, and kind of shedding light on on some of the the, the tribulations you go through as, as, a, as a Black footballer, you know. Um, it's, 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 it's difficult sometimes, you know. I remember as a young kid, I had a few spells with, with my youth team. Um, and this is before I joined the, the Unions Academy. And have you ever been one of the only black kids on the team? I mean, come on now. That's that was like I thought that was what it was supposed to be <laughs> coming up. You know, I thought that was the norm. I thought it's funny. Uh, it's funny because <clears throat> I think because my family, we all played. Right. I guess I noticed it, but I didn't notice it as much. I think it was when I got to maybe junior high or high school is when. And you start really being more immersed in, in, in the social norms and, and getting involved in the social component of life that it really started to present itself to me. And I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. All my friends, all my black friends, they, they play basketball and football. And I remember being, um, you know, junior high, high school, I made it a point. Like I had to, I had to make sure that I was nice at basketball and football just mm -hmm. because uh -huh. no one was trying to play soccer. Like that was that wasn't a thing. And so for me, I was like, all right, I need to make sure, although I was 
at those at those ages, I was better at my sport than they were ever mm-hmm. than they were anywhere okay. near as good right. in their sport. But in my mind, I was like, they don't really care about soccer, so it doesn't it doesn't really equate. I need to make sure that I'm nice in basketball and football, in addition to being good in soccer, mm-hmm. for it to be kind of like on a level playing field, if that makes sense. And so, yeah, I mean, throughout my my youth career, I'm trying to think back now, but most times there was it was me and then maybe let's see one maybe two others two other black kids on my team and that was that was a norm that was a norm I mean most times we were the best guys on the team um but that was that was just the norm and again I, I don't think it really I started paying attention to it and 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 recognizing the significance of it until I got to a little bit of a more mature age. I think the 94 world cup was also kind of, when I look back on it now, it's also, it also stands out in my mind because I look at that 94 world cup team and this is where I'm kind of really, really excited about your group right now too. Cause you've seen a progression, you've seen um, more and more faces that look like ours picking mm-hmm. up and adopting this sport. You look back at the 94 world cup and I think back to that team and off the top of my head, I could be wrong, but the guys that I think about, with Ernie Stewart, uh, mm-hmm. Kobe Jones, mm-hmm. and off the top of my head, that's all that comes to mind. Whereas fast forward to to your generation right now, you could fill the whole team of, of of black guys on your team, right? And it's I think that's great to see more and more kids have fallen in love with this game. So I'm kind of curious for you, like what you know? I'm sure you were exposed to many sports growing up as well. Like what was it that made you choose this sport over all the others as well? I mean, for me, it was <clears throat> some of you. I, I had friends. Everybody was hooping, right? Everybody was hooping. So I was like, ah, dang, I got to make sure I'm good at basketball. So yeah. it wasn't until I was, I want to say, like freshman, sophomore year of high school that I was like, dang, you know, I'm starting, I'm starting to really pick up the Union's Academy, you know, but I was still trying to play basketball. Like I was, I was still playing. I had AAU. I was – you know, travel ball was on the, you know, I was playing with the high school team. So now you're, you're dividing your time and you still got classwork. You know, my mm-hmm. parents always stick, you know, making sure that I'm completing my studies, making sure I'm getting my education and, and, and doing that to my max as well as putting, you know, effort into to, to my extracurricular activities. And yeah, it was, it was tough because I was leaving that social group of, of people that I was, you know, hanging out with regularly to, to now going to, an environment where I was love the game. Don't get me wrong. I love the game. And that's what has kept me going, you know, to this very day, you know, but it's sometimes difficult when you can't relate to the situations that those your peers are going through. Right. You know, I'm hearing these kids going to these prestigious uh, prep schools, you know, and, 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 and getting the, the craziest boots and, and the, the, the flyest gear, all, you know, that and the other. And, and I come from a humble background, my parents, two hardworking individuals, my dad from Jamaica, who's, came to the States with little in his pocket with his mom, you know, my mom roll up her sleeves and get the job done. You know, as a black woman, she, she fights for each and every opportunity she can get. Right. So my parents are like, listen, at the end of the day, you may not have the, the flashiest cleats. You may not have this, that and the other, but you are blessed. You got two feet that work. You are blessed with an ability to go on that field. And every time you step on that field, make sure you put your best foot forward. You know, and even when it's not your greatest day and even when you're surrounded by people who you may not be able to connect with, use that as common ground, you know, but make sure you're showing yourself well and you're, you're showing what you can do. You know, don't don't hold yourself back because you don't have what they what the others have. Right. So I think that was the, the foundation for me. And that's what kind of kept me going, you know, in those times where I felt like the, the, the I would not when it's called the outsider, but in a way you do feel like an outsider sometimes. Um, and even making jokes and, and, and stuff like that. I can't, I, I can't relate to some jokes still to this day, but at the same time, you know, we, we can laugh and, and, and joke about, about the game in its own. So, um, yeah, I think we've come a long way, you know, in sharing the locker room from when I was U14 in the national team now to having, shoot, you know, I can go off to the top of my head and name, name a bunch of black players that, you know, are, are, are playing big roles not only the national team, but, but at the, at the club teams as well. So, you know, it's a special time for me, you know, to, to be involved in that, uh, playing a role. Um, but it's, it's not been easy, you know, sometimes coming through that and, and getting through that, that barrier. Uh, Cause it's, it's at times you kind of, uh, I had a youth coach, for example, um, they stripped me of uh, my youth 
captaincy because uh yeah because i was i think i was the only black player on the team and uh for real yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh i was going to i was actually in the process of joining the union's academy but i was making every single one of the training sessions every single one of the training sessions for the youth team putting trying doing everything i could to make sure i was still representing the team well right um because it didn't know what the union if i was going to even make the union's team you know but i still wanted to make sure i was going to the training sessions but i would not skip my club sessions you know i was always right. there i was always on time i was always making sure that you know we're doing the right things i was always stepping off to the pitch and making sure the guys are tuned in and sharp and i think there was a bit of jealousy within the team as you know this black kid you know what i'm saying you know he's he's better than me why is he getting the opportunity to go you know and it started to create a buzz a little bit you know and at the time I was like, man, you know, like, I just want to play the game, you know? So I was like, I don't even care anymore. Here, take it, blah, 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 blah. And my mom was like, you know what? You be the higher man. You know, we'll have this discussion, you know, when you get home, you know, that night, that night when, when it happened. She was like, don't let them strip you of, of your confidence as a player simply because they're jealous of your of the, the opportunities that you're, you're blessed with, you know, because your journey hasn't been easy. And I promise you, your journey's not going to be any easier. You're going to go through all kinds of things. You know, but that was like my first taste of it a little bit. Um, and yeah, That's, I think from that point, from that point, it kind of it kind of set me up, you know, um, and, and and gave me the precedence of like, yeah, you got to be on guard because yeah, it ain't gonna be easy. Yeah, no, nah, that's but that's again, that's it's so important that you have your mom in that scenario, right? Who can step in and kind of be like, look, I can. I can understand what you're going through. And it's so important that you remain who you are, right? You find strength in these kind of moments where at times you're made to feel less than or weaker or, or this is being used against you for whatever reason. So it's so, I mean, it's so valuable and so important. I'm sure that's a heavy, heavy learning lesson for you, but something that's strengthened you. Um, and it's, it's kind of just doubled down on, on the characteristics that you now present. Because if you would have told me this, I would have never guessed this about you from when I first met you, right? You've always come across me as this very proud, but also humble and confident. I think confident is the best word because you're very sure of who you are, right? And it comes through the way you speak. You're very authoritative in the way you speak, but then it's also very um, welcoming at the same time, if that makes sense. And I think that's these journeys that we go through, this process that we go through, it shapes you into who you are. You talked, you, you mentioned something earlier about finding that common ground. And I think this is, uh, although we are, we're living through an era and we're, this has been not just this era, this has been a trend and a, and a thing that's ex existed in this sport, you know, racism, racism in this sport. But I do think that um, you mentioned common ground. This sport is also a unifier in the sense that it mm -hmm. brings us together. Because I mentioned, you know, although I was one of the few black kids on my team, it didn't dawn on me until social pressures or social existence exactly. started to become more real to me. And it's because of the sport, right? Because although, yeah, we come from different backgrounds, we experience different things. They have new boots. I'm wearing hand-me-downs for my sisters who, and those, <laughs> it might be a couple sizes too big for me and I'm wearing double socks to make it work. I wasn't even thinking about that just because I was just so in love with the game. So bro, what is, it's Black History Month, right? And, and we're sitting here, what does it mean to you what does black history month mean to you what does black history month mean to me you know it's it's funny because you know there was a i go through these moments where i'm like well, why should we have black history month should this not be a celebration should we not should this not be a thing that we celebrate all year long right celebrate mm -hmm. black excellence and and special moments and and different figures that have had impacts on our lives but Black History Month to me, it's a chance to to still learn, right? I, I feel like every Black History Month that, that comes around, um, obviously stories are more profiled and there's more um, there's more stories being told and celebrated and, and and figures historical or current who are now having a chance to to have more impact and have their stories be at the forefront. And so as much as I feel like, you know, I'm pretty well versed, there's still there's still so much that I learn. And I think that's that's so dope that we continue to still be educated about our history and our present. Right. So mm -hmm. I think it's a chance to celebrate who we are as people, the strides that we've made, the 
the strides that we're still pursuing as well. But it's a chance to kind of, to not only educate ourselves, but educate the world. Because there's so many stories that are swept under the rug or that get misplaced or, or hidden. Some are even hidden, you know? And so I think it's so important that we really take advantage of this moment to celebrate who we are as people, um, but continue to now continue to fight for more, to keep pushing for more. And to this, maybe, maybe this should just be like the kicking off month for us. Like we, right. Right. This is the start of the, uh, I guess, January for whatever reason we get a, we get a miss there, but then <laughs> February black history month, we start that ball and we let that thing keep rolling throughout the course of the year. And we continue to just celebrate who we are as a people and tell our stories. Uh, moments like this, a chance for us to just talk about our similarities, our differences, how we can inspire each other and push each other from afar. And I, I think it's just a, you know, that for me is what I take this month as a, now a chance to just continue to educate myself, educate those around me and then motivate. What about you? Yeah, for me, it's yeah, trying to piggyback off what you said. It's, it's yeah, the month we get to, to celebrate the successes, the achievements, the history that 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 black people have have collectively put together, you know, um, it's like uh, it's like that that intro chapter, you know. I like to say is mm-hmm. to to Black history, you know, because like you said, it's not just the a February thing, you know. There's also March, there's April, May, June, July. All of these, there's so many other months in the year, right? And there's a lot of history that goes along with that, you know, um, in, in in our culture. So I think that it's it's a time for us to to kind of uh, get that that. Yeah, build the celebrations up. You know, it's like that that first kickoff, like you said, um, to to Black History. You know, but again, there, there's so many there's so many different aspects. You know, to it. You know, there's the oh, there's sports, and we talk about sports. There's so many. I, I think back to a project I did back when I was in, I think it was like middle school, elementary school, on George Washington Carver mm-hmm. and peanut butter. You know, and all of the all what he did, you know, and right. all the 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 uh, inventions and uh, opening people's eyes to to the uses of, of peanuts, you know, and in this simple uh, the simple I don't even what is a peanut? Is it vegetable? I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Actually, I should probably go back to my project and, and do some more research again. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? But you know, you talk about that and it's like, man, I didn't even know, you know, I didn't even know about that and all the dominoes that fell after that. Um, you know, so there's so many different areas, you know, that, that we can talk about, you know, in black history. And I think this month is, is only a beginning to, to that celebration, you know, like you said. So, um, yeah, it's February 8th, not was it February 8th. Yeah. yeah February 8th. Still got 17. Let's, let's see, let's see this, let's see this map real quick. No, no, wait, wait, how many, what, is it a leap year? Is it a leap year? Is it leap year? I'm thinking, I'm like, you said we got 25. a few more weeks. You said we got a few, yeah, we more, got a few weeks. more weeks, you know, we got a few more weeks until, <laughs> dang, I need brother more math a little bit, but yeah, it's, uh, we still got a few more weeks in the month, but we also got a lot of weeks in the year, you know, to celebrate, you know, all that, that is to be done as well. You know, there's a lot of time and there's, uh, there's a lot of space that, that still needs to be covered. So I'm excited, you know, um, to, to again, like to be a part of this conversation that we're having now, but but also the the many conversations that are going to be had, the many doors that are going to be opened in the future. So, um, yeah, let's let's enjoy the moment. Most definitely. Hey, uh, just real quick, um, who is since we are talking about Black History Month, is there? And we both are athletes, right? Footballers, uh, former anyway. Uh, is there? <laughs> now you can say like you can say you used to say you play a little bit. Yeah, I'm still, still a footballer, right? Still in that mix. <laughs> who is like your? You know, who is like your? Whether it's a footballer or just sporting in general, um, hero that that inspired you to want to pick up either a ball or to just pursue sports in general. Mm, I would say. Uh, Footballing wise, I would say it was Clarence Sador. Okay, he uh, he was one who inspired me. I love uh, Italian football, and and I used to wake up in the mornings and watch the Serie A games. You know, back when he played for AC Milan, I used to watch the games with my dad in the morning. So seeing him play, um, and seeing his his calmness on the ball, his composure, but his ability to to make a game, you know, from from his position, I think that's what kind of gave me that inspiration. You know, at, coming up and 
youth football was midfielder. So, so that was like, yeah, you know, I like and they that. They moved you that further back, huh? You know, you know what I'm saying? You know, uh, another one, Makalili, you know, he's another one, you know, uh, who I enjoyed watching. Um, and then as I got older, uh, turned into Thierry Henry because I like scoring goals, of course. You know, you, you love scoring <laughs> goals, but you know, they move you back as time goes on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sports wise now I, I I'm a big fan of LeBron and, and all he does you know and the way he carries himself uh he's a top professional he's a true professional you know and I think uh his willingness to to give back to his community and to remember where he came from you know his uh, ability as an entrepreneur outside the game you know his ability to diverse diversify himself and I think that's something that that inspires me as well um, so I gave you a few of my sporting, uh, sporting heroes, but yeah, man, what, what, what about you? I, th- I think within the sport and first, the first person that I saw playing the sport, I told you before was my dad. Right. So that was, that was my first sporting hero, although, you know, he played like semi-pro in Nigeria and I never got a chance to see that, but that old man's league and watching, <laughs> <laughs> watching that and, um, seeing the joy that he got from from everything like that, that was just like the game, the sport there in its purity for me was, you know, that was, that was it. Like just seeing, again, like I said, these old men who some weren't even running around anymore. Some were, can still, we're still pretty nimble. and can move around the pitch, but just seeing how the pure joy, the consistency, because we go play every Sunday. Mm -hmm. Um, But just seeing the purity of the game there was what initially just made me fall in love with it. And then I say him because Throughout my journey until he had his stroke, we were like that, right? Throughout the whole process. We so I, I'm an Arsenal fan because the first team I ever started watching was Arsenal. And mm-hmm. there weren't many games on TV, I guess, or maybe I didn't have channels of the channels that they had the games, right? And so <clears throat> one of the teams that he coached was was Arsenal within our in our neighborhood and our area. And so one of the kids on his team, his dad would record the games, Arsenal games on TV, bring in the training, giving to my dad. We come home and we watch the Arsenal game together. So boom, like that was my kind of introduction. That was my first thing that I really started watching and supporting. So I would say, yeah, my dad was my first introduction and hero within the sport. Um, then, I mean, on that Arsenal team, you had the likes of like Ian Wright mm-hmm. and seeing and then Patrick Vieira when I started yeah, realizing like I'm more of a midfielder yeah. um, on Reed because of what he was to that club and just come on now but then just sporting in general Michael Jordan was my sporting hero mm-hmm. you know like just that was the first time you saw an athlete who was maybe bigger than the sport and just he had a, every time I when I just think of Michael Jordan I think of this aura around him mm-hmm. and just everything that he embody embodied um, and, and then even things that he's done beyond the game, but I think we've had some good examples of players who have transitioned and found mm-hmm. their entrepreneurial spirit and figured and found ways to be more within the sport and beyond mm-hmm. the sport. He's an example, Magic Johnson example, LeBron mm-hmm. James is, a, is an incredible example. I think when you think about this current generation, he's, he's that guy, the way that he continues to push the norms and challenge the norms and find ways to stay authentic and true to who he is while still finding ways to dabble in different spaces that maybe were taboo to, or, or were, were looked, or we didn't have access to before. He's found ways to not knock on those doors. He didn't go and say, hey, excuse me, can I? No, he went and kicked in those doors and created exactly. his own niche within those different, those different genres of, um, those different genres. So I think like, yeah, definitely he's another one that I would say is just changing the way that we look at athletes and changing the way that we look at what we can do as athletes. And I'm curious, I, I don't want to speak for you. I'm curious, do you recognize and appreciate the, the responsibility that comes with the position you're in now? I think I, there were moments during my career where I recognized it and I appreciated it and I took it really on board. But I think when I retired and I had a chance to like really look back on my career and digest things and, and speak about specific moments is when I realized like, you know what? I was in a position of where I had a lot of responsibility. I was, I needed to be setting as much as I'm chasing my own dreams and I'm pursuing my own goals. I'm also paving the way for this next generation in my own little way. Maybe it's a small minuscule part of a bigger process, but it, it is a way of chipping away at things. So I'm just curious as do you feel that responsibility and is it something that, and how do you go about embracing it, celebrating it and at the same time 
battling it at times. Yeah, I do. I do feel the, I, I wouldn't even call it pressure. I just, just label it as responsibility, you know? Um, again, we're blessed to be in this position, right? You know, so we have a lot of eyes on us as it is, you know, and, and I always think back in the past of what would, if I was in my position to, at this moment, you know, what would I want the little kid to think about me? You know, if he came and he, you know, he had a conversation with me or, you know, he wanted a picture or he just wanted to speak or he just wanted to, you know, express, you know, his, uh, his appreciation for assigning this little, th- you know, what would I want to come across as to that kid? You know, how is, how was that impression going to, to, to leave him, you know, when he walks away? Um, and that's the mentality that I've tried to have going forward, you know, in, in, in this career, you know, in, in this area, you know, that, that we're in. Um, but again, when you're surrounded by a group of guys, I don't think it's a sole responsibility. You know, I think it's everybody picking up pieces, you know, and picking up their collective. Part. Exactly. You know, it's, it's a team. Uh, yeah. It's a collective. Um, it's a collective march, as I like to call it, you know, it's a collective march, you know, we're each in our own lanes and we're each handling and, and doing our own little thing but we're moving towards a, a, a common ground, right? You know, when using football as that common ground and as that, as that vessel to take things, you know, in the right direction. Uh, so, yeah, I, I try and simplify it as, as much as I can, but it's, it's just about thinking what would that little kid think about me, you know, if he was to meet me someday or if he was to have a conversation with me, what is the legacy that I want to leave? You know, what's mm. that impression? You know, even if it's something small, even if it's, uh, go into, you know, and, and having a little coaching clinic at a, at a high school, at a local high school, or at a local youth academy, you know, something like that, you know, where you still have the opportunity to, to relate with football, but also just to relate about life, you know, to talk about little things like, oh, you know, how was your favorite subject in school? And it may not seem, it seems silly and minuscule, right? But, you know, you having and building that connection, building that relationship with one individual, you never know what, how that domino could fall. You never know what could lead you know where that conversation could lead a, a, another kid you know so um i talk like i'm so old right i talk like i'm uh, you know <laughs> but but it's 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 as you're speaking and i don't know if you how, how often you've told this story but i remember very very vividly everything that you just said right now just took me back to a specific moment when i was with the union and um i'm curious if you remember it uh i was like last minute we had just finished training and and one of the one of the owners or one of the staff was like, Hey, can you do an appearance? And I was like, oh, I, yeah. Okay. What do you need me to do? They're like, oh, looking, I remember this. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, they're like, you'd be doing a big favor. It's one of the owners, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, no problem, whatever. And it was to go to this, um, this youth camp. It was in Delaware. And so, you know, cool. I'm whatever. I'm I, the PR guy. I'm with him and he's driving me there. Pull up. I, you know, I didn't know what to expect. I wasn't even sure what age these kids were. I just knew it was, you know, young kids and go and just kind of inter- interact with them. And I show up and who is already there <laughs> leading the charge, leading the crowd, has these kids all riled up and enjoying life, but you. And I remember just thinking like, I remember I asked the PR guy at the time, I was like, oh, Mark's doing the appearance too? They were like, no. I was like, oh. And then I, you know, I, I go over obviously and we're talking. I'm like, oh, what are you doing here? And you just, this is one of my, uh, I think it was like one of your youth or your local yeah, teams from when you were a kid. Yeah. There you go. Stars, and I was like, yeah. so, so for me, like, as you're sitting here talking about how you view giving back and how you view your position within the game, it's not that you're just speaking false narratives or you're just speaking like things that I want to hear or that people want to hear. This is, this is real life. This is really you. And this is, how old were you then? You could have been more than like, what, 17, 18 at the time? I was like, yeah, I was like 17 probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it was so, a summer, yeah. And I just remember that always stuck with me because I was like, here is a kid who is just getting introduced to the first team, right? But still recognizes the value that he has and the position that he's in, that he's that he's just getting into. And already he has that in him that he needs, that he feels the need to want to give back and inspire that next generation. And and I'll, in all honesty, I was there were so many moments when I was just kind of just watching you. Like I was just watching you and seeing how it just seemed so. And I'm not trying to gas you right now either. You know, no, 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 no. I, I, I will be quick to like, like <laughs> <laughs> to wipe that away. This is just me speaking honest truth. Um, there were just so many moments when I just caught myself just wa- looking over and watching you. And it was just it's it was seamless. You seem to genuinely be enjoying what you were doing. I think that's so important. Some people I like how you answered that question because you said it's not pressure. It's just responsibility. And some people feel 
and take it on as it's almost like a job or it's like a burden for them. You genuinely were interacting with these kids and I was just looking at them and seeing how they were smiling and just gravitated towards you. And it was a powerful moment, especially at that stage of my career to see a young kid coming through who was good at the game, but also was good off the field. He knows what his, uh, he knows, again, it goes back to me saying, you know who you are, you know what's important to you and you show that. So that's just, I want to put that out there because as you were talking, I was like, man, that just took me right back to that moment. No, I remember that. I remember that. It was, uh, yeah, it was, it was good. It was, it was a great event, you know, and, and having you there as well, you know, having one of my, one of my uh, footballing uh, brothers, you know, one of the guys that I could connect with, you know, one of the guys I connected with and had the opportunity to, to train and work with, you know, on a, on a regular basis, you know, having that there to show like, yeah, this is this is two two different generations, but we, we still we still have that 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 area where we can come back and enjoy, you know, enjoy hanging out with the kids and whatnot. Um and, and having you offer, you know, being in in the, the, the position, you know, having you offer the the wisdom, you know, whatnot. I could still relate to the words because I still hadn't even got to that level yet, you know. So no, it's those little moments that, that I think are are huge, you know. Um and, and even as a young guy, even um, 22. I'll be 23 at the end of this month. It's it's something. Still a that, baby, man. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. Don't let the beer fool you guys. I shave his beard <laughs> off. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, yeah. You know, it's little moments, man. That that I appreciate and cherish most. You know, and I think that again at the end of my career, you know, what's what what do I want to leave behind? You know, what do I want people to remember me as? So, um, yeah, it's not pressure responsibility you know simply responsibility you know and it's something that we can all take up you know across the board so uh, to change gears a little bit let's talk about your climb through college college soccer um and into professional realm you know what was that that journey like there you know going at going to maryland you know and then ultimately making the the move to to play you know professionally uh overseas you know how, how did that transition go and, and what was that experience like it honestly was difficult because uh, my dad had a stroke my senior year of high school. And so as I'm going through that process of trying to choose schools, your natural inclination is to stay close to home, right? Like you want to be close to your family. My dad and I, like I said, that was, he was big mo, I was little mo throughout our little soccer communities over here in California. And so naturally that was a, that would have been the easiest decision to stay close to home, go to like UCLA. Um, and then somehow Maryland came on my radar. Sasha Swarovski over there did a good job of, of tapping in with, with, my, with my mom and with my family and coming out here and visited us. And when I, went to, when I went to campus and had a chance to see that and just talk to some of the players and I had a real conversation with him, ultimately it just boiled down to what do I want to do beyond, beyond college? And my dream, my goal was always to play professionally. So I realized and I recognized that you know, the professional world can be cutthroat. You're not going to always have the luxury to choose where you're going to play. You're not going to, if I went to MLS, if I went the MLS route, I wasn't going to say, hey, Don Garber, put me in LA. I need to be close to my family, right? So I knew that I needed to grow up. I needed to mature. I needed to become more independent. And when I narrowed it down to two schools, it was UCLA versus versus Maryland, one school on the West Coast, one school on the East Coast. <clears throat> and I, I was like, Maryland's a better fit for me. It's going to force me to, be out of my comfort zone a little bit more. <clears throat> I had, like I said, I had a good rapport with Sasha and the things that I, that I spoke to him about what my goals were, my ambitions were aligned with the way that he was constructing and building that program. And it just seemed like a good fit for me. And again, God willing, it worked out. And then when the time came to leave school, I spent three, three seasons there at Maryland. And, you know, you start hearing these whispers about like, Oh, there's opportunity here, there, Europe or this or that MLS. And then that was a whole nother conversation because both of my parents were teachers, very, very, very strict about school. If my if my grades weren't on point, I wasn't kicking the ball anywhere. I wasn't kicking the ball in the house, let alone going to practice, right? So yeah. school was always very, yeah, school was something that was like beat into me since I was a kid. And then, you know, because it was beat into me as a kid, I, I appreciated the value of it. And I was, I was passionate about school just as much as I was about playing the sport. So that was another hard decision. Cause my mom was like, well, why do you need to leave early? If you're that good and if these opportunities right. are there, they'll be there next year. Why don't you just get your degree? And then right. like, mom, man, like, <laughs> you know, so it was a fight with her, but in the end, I was like, I want to play. I want to play. And I made her a promise that I would finish my degree 
COVID happened. Let's fast forward real quick. COVID happened, and I was actually able to finish my degree last year. It took a while, but we got there. We got there. Hey, we got there. That's all that matters, you know? We got there, right? So I, I tick that box now. But yeah, so I made that decision and I I decided I had a, there was some there was a couple of whispers about potentially going to, to Europe, a couple of teams in Germany. At the time, I thought, like, you know what, MLS might be a better route for me initially to get my feet wet, get some to get acclimatized, to uh, acclimated to to the professional setting and and kind of progress from there. And so I made this decision to go to MLS first, drafted by Toronto first pick. And I was fortunate that I went into a system where, you know, as a young player, it's so important that you play. Right. Some of your best education comes from making mistakes, but just going mm-hmm. through that po- that process and playing real minutes. And so I had a coach in Mo Johnson who who drafted me, we had a really good conversation. I remember I was, I was nervous to, to speak with him first and foremost, my first professional coach and just been drafted. I'm staying in the same hotel in Toronto and he's like, Hey, come down to the bar. I think I was like 20. (laughs) So I'm like, all right, dude, how do I play this? Do am I, do I play it like cool? And I actually have a drink or do I just like, how do I play this? (laughs) But it was a good conversation. And I, I spoke with him and I spoke my ambitions. I was like, look, I, I'm excited to be here in Toronto. Um, I, I want to be something in this game. I want to do, I want to fulfill my potential, but ultimately I do want to go to Europe. And he straight up looked me in the eye and said, you give me a couple of good seasons here. And if an offer comes for you, I won't stop it. You know, I'll do everything in my, in my power to, to help you achieve your goal. And you know what? He stayed true to his, to his word. Um, I had a good first season in Toronto, broke into the national team, rookie of the year, all that kind of stuff. And then after the Olympics, an offer came, uh, well, better offer came and it was Rangers. And to his credit, maybe it's because he was it's a club he also played for. Maybe I don't know. But to his credit, he helped and or he didn't stop it from happening. He he made sure the deal went through, and then I made that jump overseas. And I think that's when it was really it was pretty crazy, right? Because I think going from college to MLS was a jump. Obviously, it's a different level, different responsibilities and expectations because now it's your living it's your livelihood you're mm-hmm. playing for a check mm-hmm. and that man next to you is trying to feed his family he actually has kids whereas I'm this young kid like so you're competing against this man who's trying to feed his family so it's different and then you jump to Europe and I'm sure you've experienced it now as well it's it's now taking up another notch right it's cutthroat like what you do today doesn't mean nothing tomorrow it's all it's about reinventing yourself and showing yourself every single day in training and and then you're it, was, it wasn't so much a culture shock in the sense that I'm learning a different language, but it's a culture shock in the sense that this is a football crazy country. You mm-hmm. know, I'm playing, there's there's two major teams in this country and I'm playing for one of those two teams. So there's a a massive spotlight on you. Everything you do is amplified. Whereas in Toronto, you know, good fan base, good support, but there was, you could still, I could still walk through the city and, you know, some pockets I've noticed more, but other pockets I could be like anonymous. Whereas here now I'm in Glasgow and I'm playing for Rangers and, and in the beginning I wasn't even playing. I was just, I was a part of Rangers. I was a signing for Rangers, man, you, 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 do you do anything in the city? You do anything like it's, there's a spotlight on you and people take notice. And so that, I think that was kind of opened my eyes a little bit more, but at the same time, that's kind of the environment I wanted to be in where the sport meant that much to people and, I was fortunate when I went there, Bees was there, DeMarcus Beasy was there. So mm-hmm. he was kind of like big brother, yeah, little, yeah. little big brother. Little you big know? brother, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like showed me the ropes a little bit. And I leaned on him a lot, you know, asked a lot of questions, kind of followed his lead a little bit. And you learn through the process. You learn through the process, but it's where I wanted to be. And so I was fortunate that I had that opportunity to go over there and experience that. Now, the the old firm, Darby. Because mm. nah, uh, – by the way, I had some some interest from Celtic, you know, and I, I know was controversial. I was a controversial topic between us, but yeah, you know, it's still no love lost. But but yeah, not, enlighten us on that experience and and, and playing in that derby because it's 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 from what I've heard, and and hopefully we'll I want to go and attend the derby one day. But from what I've heard, it's that city is is already football crazy, but that derby is shut down the day, shut down everything. This is do or die, you know. Can can you enlighten us on, on the experience of playing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you you we joke about that, right? That you when you were linked to Celtic, but I, I remember when we had that conversation, I said, like, this as much as I would rather you go to Rangers, it's a mass <laughs> Celtic is a massive club, right? And because of that old firm rivalry and that old firm derby, um, the 
the exposure you get from playing for a, either of those two teams, it, it can set you up for a massive next jump, right? But all from Darby, man, I mean, I knew about just the history a little bit from playing FIFA and seeing some stuff like from years before. But then you get there and instantly you're like thrown into the midst of it. I remember like, my, I think it was my first game or second game that I was there, I was on the, that I was on the bench for was against was an old firm derby. And um, I was hoping I was going to come on and make my debut in that game. It didn't happen, but you're right. Everything is shut down. Like I said before, there's two massive clubs in Scotland, right? And it's Rangers Celtic. But then beyond, beyond like football, there's not like a ton of quote unquote celebrities beyond football, like football dominates that country. And so everything kind of revolves around and, and is, and everyone supports one of the, one of one of the other. And so before the game even happens, now before a ball is even kicked the whole week in the press and the media, the papers, it's just Rangers. So it's like, what's happening? Here's where they're at. Here's what this game means. This and that back and forth, boom, boom, boom. You go in the city for dinner and the whole conversation is everyone's just talking about that. And, um, you, you feel the pressure before a ball is even kicked. And then it's funny because sometimes the games, they come and it's just like, sometimes it's beautiful football. Other times it's just like straight chaos because it's just, you feel the passion, especially when you have a team, when either team is dominated by Scottish players, the history and the mm -hmm. affinity that they have for their club, especially if they grew up supporting that club, it's, it's reflected in how they play. But the history is deep, man. I'm sure you know about it a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. You know, Rangers used to be a Protestant club. Mm -hmm. Celtic was a Catholic club. So whenever you throw mm -hmm. religion into the mix, you throw inner city rivalry into the mix, you throw – there's just so many components that make that clash heated. And, yeah, it was – it was if we lost, like, you're not going out. You, <laughs> you hop on that bus, you get back to uh, the stadium, get in your car, go home, and that's it. They, your night is shut down. But when you win, of course, like you, you're the big man. So of course, uh, yeah. And so that's one of the definitely one of the rivalries that I look back on. But I mean, my time in Scotland, since we're talking about Black History Month and everything like that, and I mentioned bees already. I, I remember being there, and there was maybe about five guys, five black guys on my team there. But whenever me and bees were in the city, and we saw like a black person, we'd be like. Like, yo, is that your friend? That was like, no, no, that's one of your friends. You know, just because there was a yeah. joke about it, but it was, you know, there was so few and far between. Um, but so in addition to everything else that's going on, you're also adjusting to that and what that dynamic is like. And of course, it's documented already. I experienced, you know, racism when I was out there. And it's unfortunate because, you know, we talked about earlier about how beautiful this game is and how good of a job it does in unifying us and bringing cultures together. There are still these small pockets of, of, you know, ignorant fans. This is across, mm -hmm. this is even happens in the States. There's still mm -hmm. small pockets of ignorant fans who, you know, choose to use this beautiful sport as their means to, to be ignorant and, and, and for lack of better terms, just stupid. Right. And so it's unfortunate that I experienced that, but it didn't, it didn't take away from my experience. There are still special, special moments. That I look back on with fond memories. And that's why when you brought it up Celtic, that was a possibility for you. I was like, yeah, I encourage you to go there. Although, we would have been enemies on any given day, but you know what I mean? I, I encourage you because it, I thought it would be a good landing spot for you. Yeah, man. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting you touched on that with, with, with bees and whatnot. Cause I, I kind of see that sometimes now and here in gank, you know, gangs a smaller town, you know? So if I see another, another black person, I'm like, yo, <laughs> wait a minute. Yo, it was, <laughs> I'm like, it, it's out this side of one of my teammates. So I'm like, yo, was good <laughs> you need a freyo <laughs> exactly but, uh, but yeah man you know i think it's uh yeah it's it's unfortunate you know that it still plagues the game you know the the racism that we see you know i haven't experienced it here you know and god willing i don't but it's the unfortunate reality of, of of having ignorance within within the game that we love right um we've already had situations break off with uh vincent company at anderlecht you know and, and a few of his players um playing in the mat you know so it's it's still running you know it's it's way out the the system of the game but it's still um, still there you know and i think it's it's never there's, there's going to be a point where we really have to, to to do more we talk about it all the time we talk about it all the time but but what is that line you know and, and i think it's it's relative in each situation um you know whether it's walking off the pitch or, or stopping the game or, or whatever it is you know but i think it's it's something that we 
across the football and world are going to have to come to a consensus on and, and make sure that it's, you know, we, we rid ourselves of it, you know, and, and it doesn't only encompass football itself, you know, but, but educating each other outside of the pitch, you know, this is the world we live in. I think the diversity of the world, you know, diversity of society, that is the beauty of it. You know, that's mm. football in its own, right. The diversity yes. of football, having people from all over the world, be able to come and connect and, 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 and bridge the gaps and connections between each other and share stories and like, like, Oh, snap. Now they go through the same thing. I something, something similar, you know, we'll be coming you know, more empathetic, understanding from the other side of things, you know, how, how it really, you know, how somebody uh, reacts in certain situations and feels about certain, um, you know, certain conversations that I had, you know, so it's, yeah, I think that is the the, the beginning, but, but it also has to, to not be the end, you know, um, and, and to kind of go off of that is from a football standpoint, what do you think needs to be changed? You know, and that's a, it's a broad, broad question. You know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll speak more so on the, 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 the American side of the game. Let's talk about just in the States, you know, uh, we're talking about bridging that gap, you know, creating more uh, opportunity, you know, what needs, what, what needs to be done, you know, cause it's, it's something that, that we see, you know, I think for me, having and seeing more people like yourself, you know, and I get you can speak to it as well. See more people like yourself in positions of power, it gives you that inspiration to go and do that as well. Right. You know? Um, so, so for you, I just want to kind of hear your thoughts on it. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think it's multifaceted, right? There's so many areas that can, can be improved and exposure, accessibility, representation are definitely words that, words that have power and meaning behind them right accessibility meaning how do we allow how are kids able to if they have the, the option to 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 play this game well even before accessibility introductions right to the sport so i was fortunate you were fortunate that we were introduced to the sport but there are so many kids that i grew up playing with or i'm sorry that i grew up that i was friends with that never had that introduction to the sport right so they never even had a chance to fall in love with it they never even knew that that was an option for obviously as a, as a future uh, means of employment, but even stripping that even back, just as an option to stay, to have a safe place to play, uh, mm -hmm. an option to keep them out of trouble, an option to just make sure that, that their parents come home with no concerns, you know what I mean? So I think introduction to the sport is, is one of the first things that has to happen. And then beyond that accessibility now, we talk about, we talk about, you know, US Soccer Foundation, Black Players for Change, and the, the movement that they had in terms of building these different, these small pitches, these mini pitches across the country and trying to create safe spaces for, for kids that, to be able to play this game, uh, to be introduced to and play this game. I think that's so important because I think a lot of times we talk about, when we talk about this game, we talk about it just in terms of how can we make our national team better? How can we grow this game from a, uh, I don't want to just talk about from a business standpoint of things, but you know, there are other components and there's other levels to this game that are so important. And again, I talk about just first and foremost, letting kids introduce, be introduced to this game, fall in love with it. And for you talk about some inner, inner city communities, their parents being able to come to go to work, whether they're working late and know that their kids are being well looked after and they're staying out of trouble and they're doing things that are going to lead to them to, to be safe first and foremost, but then also develop social interactions you talk about the diversity within this sport well when you have a chance to interact with kids who don't look like you who come from different backgrounds who who you know have different concerns on a day-to-day -day basis there's so much education and value that happens from those interactions and I know that I'm the person I am because part of that comes from my soccer interaction my footballing interactions and the way that I was exposed to different things even I look at my I compare myself to some of my siblings. I was exposed to different things, being thrown into different cultures, different environments that have shaped me in a different way than I'm even shaped to them. And we came, we're born from the same two parents, right? <laughs> and then, and then when you doubt, when you doubt, take it a step further and you're talking about progressing this game and building this game for, and I'm going to speak specifically when you're trying to introduce more minorities to the sport, African-Americans or, you know, other, other, other minority groups, representation is so important. You know, mm -hmm. I talk about what this national team looks like now compared to the national team that I grew up watching. Well, I think if I was a young kid watching this national team, there's more likelihood that I'm going to I'm going to pay a little bit more attention to it. I'm going to see this. I'm going to see myself in more faces and more people 
and have a dream and drive to want to maybe pursue this because I see guys that have now proven that this can be a reality for me. Um, or now when you take that a step further, you talk about front office positions, you talk about coaching positions, you talk about broadcast side of things. I'm in this position now as a, on the media side of things. And it's one that I fully embrace. And it's, I look at it from a whole different approach now. You know, when I first got introduced to it, I was thinking like, okay, this is a good way for me to stay close to the game. I started enjoying it and I actually became really passionate about it. And then I think after about six months into it, I got a DM from, from a kid on Instagram and I'm not going to speak verbatim, but the gist of his, of his message was saying like, he was asking me if I could introduce him to someone because he wanted to do an internship. Um, and initially he said that he was just looking at NFL opportunities, NBA opportunities. And then he saw me doing a game or he saw me in the studio for one of these games. And he was like, the hell black people play soccer. Like what? <laughs> I didn't know that, that that can be a real option. Right. And so if it's one, if it's that, if that's the only DM I ever get for the rest of my life, that that's led, that's been birthed because of my position in media, I'm happy. I'm okay with that because I've inspired one person to now pursue this game or see this game, that there's opportunities for him within this sport. But I think representation goes a long way. I'm a father now, right? I'm about to be a father of two. And so I just start thinking about how can I make sure that my kids are exposed to more? My kids, my kids' friends, my nephews, my nieces, these kids that live in my neighborhood, how can I make sure that they're exposed to more than I was exposed to as a player? Um, and when I have conversations with guys like you, your generation, you know, that's why I make sure to point out without, and I'm glad that you said it's, it's responsibility, not pressure but I try to make sure that I put this on you guys' radar mm -hmm. because I would have been, I would have loved if more people would have put this on my plate or introduced me to the impact that I can have at a younger age. Although I got to a point where I recognize that, man, my voice carries some weight and I can do some real positive things. I think if it was introduced to me at a younger age, you know, you maybe move a little bit different. You're going to still do the things you need to do and you're going to grow and mature. That's natural. But having that responsibility and knowing that in some way you're, creating opportunities, not just for yourself, but that next generation of players is so important. So, man, I, I say all that and it's, I, I'm having a chance to speak with you. And I'm just, again, I'll double down on this. I'm proud of who you are, not just as a player, but who you are and the way that you see this sport, the way that you see your position, the way that you see life and the, the growth of this game here and your role within it. No, I appreciate it. And yeah. Before we kind of wrap up, uh, it's, it's funny you bring on the media side because, uh, yeah, seeing guys like yourself, like Gooch, like Michael Richards, seeing you guys on that platform, you know, uh, in the, the media realm, discussing the biggest games, you know, games that I'm dreaming of playing of, you know, and 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 whatnot, kind of gives me that itch a little bit to like, oh, maybe I maybe I want to start tapping into that media side. And, you right. know, it gives me that inspiration, you know, to go on. You know, I got a, a podcast now, so maybe building from that and, and, and find my way into, into that realm, you know. But, again, the representation is huge. You know, it's huge seeing guys, seeing people like yourself, you know. Hey, don't, uh, don't take my job too quickly, man. Don't listen, take my listen, job listen, too quickly. Listen, listen, don't listen, take listen. my job too quickly now, all right? Like, what is <laughs> you, but I don't want to take you too soon. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no! I got you. I got you. I got you. I'll, I'll make sure it's a different, different, different area. You know give me a couple saying? years. Give me a couple <laughs> years. All right. Yeah, we keep, we keep the gap. We keep the gap. Just, just to know. You know, I'll give you enough time. But, uh, but yeah, man. You know, uh, again, I appreciate you know your your words of wisdom. Um, you know, all of the advice that you passed down to me. Um, and then I want you and and all the guys from your generation who talk to my guys, you know, and in, in, in my generation, you know, we we appreciate you guys, you know, for for yeah, paving the way, you know, um, and and, and really pushing us to to take things a step further. So uh, appreciate you taking the time out of your day and having this this chat with me. It's great catching up. Uh, hopefully, I get to see you in person soon, man. And uh, yeah, bro, appreciate you. Much love, man. Always, bro. Always. You know, it's always love, man. And you guys, you, your whole group man, your teammates, you guys just keep challenging, um, challenging the norms, keep pushing forward. Um, I'm excited about watching you guys finish up qualifying and then having a hell of a run at the World Cup, man. But just keep being the person that you are, staying confident in, in everything that you believe in, man. And you, you already know that you're prime for success.